my role was the point of the spear. And the rest of the spear were all those in, in CNN, the engineers, the other staffers who'd worked to make the coverage of the Gulf War possible. And I hope along the way I can mention those people. The, I was the Israel correspondent at that time, based in Jerusalem. And I noticed in the, as that war progressed that Satama Hussein was becoming increasingly belligerent in terms of his neighbors, particularly Israel, threatening to, to burn the country with a wave of fire, or words, you know, aggressive, exaggerated claims. But the Israelis took them seriously. So the President Shamir and Moshe Arons, the defense minister, and, and Bibi Netanyahu, who was foreign, acting foreign minister, I interviewed him every day on CNN. That's a country that loves CNN. And all the Palestine, Palestinians love CNN too. So I was involved really with, the, with Saddam Hussein in Iraq at an early point in 1990 because a lot of what I wrote uh, dealt with Iraqi's threat to, uh, Iraqi threat to Israel. Robert Weiner, a uh, colleague of mine, a noted producer at that point, even more notable later, came through Jerusalem uh, on, at around Christmas time on his way home. And we had dinner, and then he told me what the network had done in Baghdad and what it intended to do, and it took my breath away. The arrangements that he had succeeded in making with the Iraqi government the willingness of the CNN news organization to provide the money, the political backing, the personal, to what was going down was just, and I said, Robert, you gotta take me in on this. Peter, he said, we've got a full staff, but I know that this will be an important part of the story in Israel, we'll see you. Just keep watching us. And I figured this is going to be the greatest story ever for CNN. I mean, I, I could see it. Because what did he tell me? He said that, first of all, he'd succeeded in uh, convincing the Iraqi government that the presence of, the, of CNN in their country, if indeed the, the promised bombing of Baghdad and other, the rest of the country came about, as George H. Bush had threatened if, if Saddam hadn't left his invasion of Kuwait, which he had occupied in early August of 1990, that they, he'd convinced them that CNN can stay. And he offered, I think, a dozen visas were promised, and he had the names of a dozen staffers, including his own, uh, Nick Robinson, his primary technician, and others, and... Uh, not only that, but Bernie Shaw would be on his way early in, uh, in January to interview Saddam Hussein. Uh, but in addition, they had developed the technical, he'd, de he'd made a technical breakthrough in dealing with the Iraqis in securing the rental of what was known as a, as a four wire. Now, a four wire was a a piece of equipment commonly used in the up to that time by major tele, you know, tele, telephone institutions and companies, and what it did it allowed the user, uh, it was there was a two line uh, system. It allowed direct contact from the loser from the user to the point of, uh, of the, to the to the to the uh, person on the other end. And the other, other person could use it with the other line would bring the sound back. And it was clear, it was a fine quality system. But in addition, the four wire that, that Robert had uh, rented was, had been buried by one of several buried by the Iraqi military in the sands of the desert and would be impervious, he said, to American bombing while the obvious telecommunications and communication systems would be down in the first hours of the war, which was expected. The four-wire 
would survive. So that was the well, that would be the first, the first that that would be the first piece of equipment that we would use when the when the regular lines were closed with the bobbing. The other equipment included an Immarsat satellite phone that Tom Johnson had succeeded in borrowing from a major oil company, I think it was Exxon. Now that piece of equipment was used at ships at sea and at Exxon's uh, refineries, Exxon production, pr production centers offshore. And that was about 60 pounds in weight, a steel case in which you could open, raise a small uh, umbrella-like antenna, aim at a satellite, one of eight satellites that Ted Turner had, in addition, booked over the years. You get onto a satellite, you make the phone call, you can get right back, you can get right to headquarters in Atlanta with that satellite phone. That had been sort of smuggled in in the preceding days. So the Iraqis didn't know about that. But the Iraqis had agreed to bring in what we call an earth station uh, from Amman, that had been shipped to, shipped to Amman. And that was a, a, the early version of what you see around every major story today. Every local station has a, a, a mobile earth station that they drive around and do live coverage. They did not exist in the 1980s, but Ted Turner's back the engineers who devised a, a portable system which had been sent to Amman, Jordan and would fit in a big truck and could be, when the time came, the final okay from the Iraqis, it would be driven to Iraq and it's opened up in the, wherever you wanted it and you could do live coverage from it and send your packages. What a setup. What a setup. I was very envious, but wasn't my time. I, you know, I, I was perfectly happy in Israel. There was great stories there, important stories. And uh, I figured that, well, part of it will flow to me, and good luck to Robert and his gang, because I knew that, you know, I'd, I'd never personally been under that kind of bombardment in my whole career, because they, in Vietnam, you know, okay, in Quezon, but in, in Quezon, you're surrounded by your own troops and you're in bunkers uh, 40 feet deep and you're going to be okay. So, six days before the war was due to begin on uh, January 16, Washington time, I get a phone call from Eason Jordan, foreign editor of the uh, CNN. He says, Peter... Uh, we need your help. Now, earlier I'd called Eason the previous month to get a part of the action, maybe go to the, the Saudi Arabian part because I knew Norman Schwartkopf. I'd cover, written stories about him in Vietnam. I'd taken a photograph of him uh, carrying a wounded uh, Vietnamese soldier from the perimeter of this, uh, this outpost that was under siege and it carrying it into the medical tent, and, that, and I'd been told that it was permanently on his office desk. He watched it every day. And that I'd had lunch with him uh, the earlier at, at, at a Defense Department dinner when I'd been visiting Washington for so, whatever reason, and I'd chatted with him, and we talked about the Gulf and remembered the old days back in Vietnam. Uh, information that he wrote, and when he wrote a book later after the war that doesn't take a hero, he has two pages talking about my uh, visit with him in Vietnam. He didn't say anything about my work in the Gulf War, which he hated, but he, he, he remembered the Vietnam period. So Eason and the AP, and CNN said to me, well, look, we've got so many people. We've got this young Christian Amon poor. We've got all these people, and we've got Blystone, and then we got, and I said, fine, you know, I think it's great. And I know they're going to do very well. But now he's on the phone and he says, well, you know, we've got a problem in Baghdad. And I said, what's happening? He says, well, it's sort of starting to collapse. I said, what's starting to collapse? Well, you know, faced with the reality of staying, I mean, we may have fewer people there. What do you think? And I said, I'm on the next plane. So I flew to through Cairo, 
that next morning and then to Amman and then got the last uh, Iraqi Airways flight in to Baghdad and Nick Robertson was there with me and I hadn't met Nick before but he was a technician and in my book I talk about how Nick uh, got through uh, crass customs with the various equipment that was very important to the to us there and I get to the El Rashid Hotel and I here's Wiener and he rushes up to me and says Peter I want you to know one thing we'll have a a plane waiting in Amman, and when you're ready to go, we'll fly in here and fly you out. And I said, Robert, I'm not going anywhere. He said, well, I just wanted to reassure you that we're in that situation. So then I run into Bernie Shaw, and Bernie says, well, I'm waiting around to interview Saddam, but, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't want to be here. He said, I'm an anchor in Washington, and I, and I, but I'm wi willing to to interview Saddam, but I want to be out of here, Peter, frankly, before all this stuff goes down. Then I meet John Holloman, uh, a great buddy of mine, uh, certainly even before that time, and he's very jovial and easygoing. He says, Peter, we're going to, I'm glad you're here. We're going to do this together. We're going to, you know, we're going to have a lot of fun, and we've got all the booze we'd ever need in the back room, and I'm a sort of a non-drinker, but there's all we have, all the all the candies and all the cookies and <laughs> truffles and stuff. And I said, fine. And settled in and did a story at some point of the city. I hadn't been there before. But I uh, wrote in my book, The Landscape of uh, Crisis is very familiar to me. <laughs> so, and I was in this hotel, this beautiful hotel, and I had the sense on arriving that CNN was a favored group because I was this, I met this, uh, the, the chief, Mr. Sadoon, the, the chief censor basically, and he embraced me and said, welcome, Mr. Peter. We're gonna call you Mr. Peter. And the team, the CNN people, Mr. Robert, of course, is, uh, and I felt pretty comfortable there. But then the pressure was increasing from Washington, from parents, from girlfriends, boyfriends, the reality of, of being in a, what seemed to be a vulnerable location, a hotel Saddam had been built as a, as a, as a, as a, is an example of the, his power and authority, an example to the rest of the world. And uh, all of, none of them there had ever really been in anything that resembled anything like that. Now, Blystone had been some time in Vietnam, and, the, and he had been experienced, but he had uh, been in touch with his family, and his wife was uh, not in good health, so he was basically required to leave, and he went out with the American ambassador when they closed, with, with the American consul, when they closed the embassy. So he was gone, and you had Bernie Shaw who told me that he, you know, he was going to leave before the war, and, and there was Holloman and I, and I felt great. And here was Robert saying that, you know, we may miss a few people, but we'll have enough, he hoped, to cover it. But then Nick Robertson, this young guy, was who I felt was the most important one there. He was the technician. He would keep communications open. He knew how to use the sat phone, and he was a smart guy and very reliable, which he has proven in the years since he's been in CNN. And I sit and talk with him about it, and we discussed it, and we discussed it. I said, you're the key man, Nick. This is the most significant story you'll have an, ever, ever have an opportunity to cover. You realize the enormity that we've been invited by an enemy country of the United States to cover the war. They're willing to bring in equipment that would allow us to cover do live broadcasts that we're going to have not access to the military side of it, but we're going to have access to the civilian side of it, and that is a very important part of this conflict. President George H. Bush has announced to all that they're attacking only military targets and maybe government centers. But he says, we're not 
involving civilians. And to me, that was a challenge. I want to see if that's true. <laughs> that was my thinking. Okay, I'll, I, I'm willing to look at it. And I didn't have any feelings for or against that war. I'd long warned, I'd, I'd long realized that it's no point in taking sides in any of these issues because that what our viewers want and what even official Washington wants from these places is an accurate accounting of what's going on. They don't want to hear what I think about the war. They want to know what I'm seeing and hearing, and they want me to get as much information I can from officials about and ask them the tough questions. Nick ultimately said, Peter, I have a woman who loves me in Amman, and she wants me out of here. What about you? And I said, well, you're right. I don't. Now, I happen to have had a, a woman who loved me, she said, in, in Jerusalem, but I didn't challenge Nick, and he would be eventually leave with Robert. But anyway, that was the setup, but I knew that this would be the most remarkable story I had ever covered, that it would be an opportunity that, that, that was, was just inexplicable, impossible to envisage just a few years earlier. And that CNN had to cover it with as many people as it could put together. But I told Bernie Shaw and Robert, I said, I'm not getting out of here. I'm staying. And as long as CNN wants me to stay, I will stay.